All right, last week I mentioned, as we're starting the book of Hebrews, um, how the book of Hebrews is, is an excellent book for tying the Old Testament with the New Testament. And, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a go-to when you want to understand some of the differences in, in why we don't do the, the, the sacrifices and things like that. What it's also excellent at is, you know, the book of Hebrews is really all about Jesus Christ. Now, you could always say, well, the entire Bible is all about Jesus. And that's true. I mean, it's, it's very thematic. But there's different books that kind of focus on different things. And there's always a direction towards Christ in every book of the Bible, undeniably. But there's different focuses as well. So you can think about the books of First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. I mean, it, it's historical books. Is there stuff about Jesus in there? Absolutely. Is there teaching about Christ? Yes. But primarily, when you look at it, they all have their own kind of section. Psalms is song books. Proverbs are just a lot of good wisdom and knowledge and teaching. The other Gospels is about the life of Jesus. I mean, so it's all about Jesus, but it's more like, I mean, we're hearing what Jesus said and what he taught. And what Hebrews does, though, it's really expository, like I said, on Jesus Christ himself as a person, as a fulfillment of prophecy, how he fits in with prophecy, with scripture, with the Old Testament, but really just geared around Christ himself. And what we're seeing here in chapter two from a very high level is Jesus Christ, the man, you know, Jesus Christ, God made flesh, the son of God, and how these Old Testament scriptures, we're going to see a few of them here that are referenced, are liter we're literally talking about Christ. And not only that, and we're going to get into this in the next few chapters, it's really emphasized quite a bit how Christ is a brother. Christ is someone who partook in the flesh, making us brethren with him. And, and you know, we'll get into that much deeper here as we get into the chapter specifically. But that, that humanity aspect of Christ, that priesthood of Christ, the sonship of Christ, um, like we saw in chapter one, how Christ is, is the son of God, but he also is God, Hebrews 1.8. Um, just real basic facts about Christ. I mean, just kind of who he is. I don't want to say outside of his doctrine and teaching, but, but you know, just, just the, person, the person of Christ uh, is, is really expounded in the book of Hebrews. So it's an awesome passage in that regard as well. So all of that being said, let's dig down because there's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of truths to uncover here in Hebrews chapter 2. Starting with verse number 1, the Bible says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Now, it's hard to just pick this up in the middle. There's a chapter division here. We're starting off in chapter 2 and it says, therefore. Well, what do you mean, therefore? Right? We have to go back a little bit in the context. And if you remember last week, I, I made a big deal of pointing out the differences between men and angels. And I kind of covered the false doctrine of the Nephilim stuff and everything else. But there is a, a, definitely a distinction is being brought here in chapter one about how angels are different. Now, angels were made mightier in power and in glory than man was. But Jesus Christ was made a man. And we're going to get more into that in chapter two. This, this thought process is, is a continuation here of, of really making sure that we understand angels and men are completely different. Not the same function, not the same purpose. And if we just go back up a little bit to, to get this in context where we're starting in, in chapter 2, um, talking about the, the heaven and the earth, verse 10 says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They, shall, uh, they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up. And they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. But to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? I'm going to unpack that a little bit. But just to give this overview, he's saying, look, now we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have 
heard. This is important stuff. And, you know, we really ought to take this as just another reminder, this passage of Scripture, even those first few words there, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. The things that we have heard, the truths that you've heard and you've learned, don't let them slip. We need to give more earnest heed to those. And I think the, the best application I make to this is don't ever get bored with coming to church, just in general. And I don't care what church it is. If you go somewhere and you're hearing things and you feel like you're not being fed, man, pay attention and listen up. And you take heed. You take heed to yourself. You pay attention. You make sure if you've got the most boring pastor in the world, I hope that's not me, but if you have the most boring pastor in the world or most boring preacher, that you could, you still take heed to yourself and say, I need to listen and pay attention. And I don't care if it's stuff that I already have heard, that I already know. I'm going to still take heed. I'm going to, I'm going to make sure that I'm not going to let this stuff slip. And this is why I do take heed in general when I try, you know, and, and nobody's right, but I try to, I try to cover things somewhat repetitively. I, I, I give a break. You know, I try to cover different topics and different things. Because just because you learn something one time, it doesn't mean you never have to go back to it again. And in fact, there's some things we really need to take heed that we do go back to and cover regularly and making sure that we're, we're keeping up on certain things. I just had a conversation with my wife today saying, you know, like, hey, I need to do another reset. I need to, I need to reorganize some things. I need to reset some priorities. I need to get things, that, not reset priorities. My priorities are already set. I need to get my life in line with the priorities that I have. We all have to do that. I mean, you, you always have to take stock and you should be analyzing that from time to time and going, hey, is the way I'm spending my time, is the thing that I'm doing, is this lining up with where my priorities are? Right? If God is your number one priority, you take a look at your life and say, well, does that reflect it? Is that really reflected? In my mind and in my heart, I could say God is number one. But from, an, let's say, an outside observer, are they going to be like, wow, that guy's really living for God. I mean, even someone who knows the Bible, say, say a born-again Christian is real wise, if they could look at your life, be like, yeah, I could see that they're putting God first in their life. Great, I hope so, right? If not, well, what, what aren't you doing? Right? Because in your, in your mind or in your heart, you might think like, well, of course God's first. And that's how I think that everyone in this room would probably say the same thing. I mean, I'd, our hearts are there, right? We, we want to serve God, but are we doing so in our actions? And that's something that, we have to all take that look at for ourselves. But what's going to help us in this area is making sure that we give that earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Right? And, and whether the things are new or old that we're heard, right? we, we need to really take heed to those things. I mean, when we gain truth, when we gain knowledge from the scripture, hey, let's, let's take heed to that so we don't let them slip. We need, we need to maintain, we need to keep things up and we don't, we don't let those slip. And one of the reasons why, it says 4, verse 2, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? So he just got done talking about these angels and the might and, and everything else, but hey, they're ministering spirits. Keep your place here. Turn, if you would, to the book of Jude. And I brought this up last week as well, you know, how angels don't have a plan of salvation with God that we're aware of. I mean, there's nothing in the word of God that's going to tell us that an angel has the capability of, you know, being saved after iniquity is found in them. Where we do, as human beings, iniquity is found in us, our spirit dies, we get born again, that spirit revives Right? And, then, and then we have eternal life, and we have redemption, and we have salvation through Jesus Christ, who became flesh, not angel flesh, male, you know, man flesh, as, again, this, cover, this chapter covers the importance of that, that he became a man. He didn't become an angel. And offered up, the, you know, offered up this himself as a sacrifice to pay for our sins so that we could receive that redemption 
angels don't have that luxury, right? And we also see, this is also why people who want to turn to James 2 and try to use that as a case as to, well, believing's not enough. And if you're not familiar with the passage of James 2, what, what some people will, will, will look to or try to bring up as evidence, they'll say, well, the Bible says that the devils also believe, right? So if the devils believe, I mean, they're not saved, right? So believing can't be enough because the devils believe. Well, hold on a second. I mean, there's a couple things wrong with, with that statement because when you look at James chapter 2, the devils believe in that there's one God is not the same, you know, anyone believing that there's one God, because that's what James 2 says. Thou believest that there's one God, thou doest well. Right? The devils also believe and tremble. Well, thou believest that there's one God. The Muslims believe that there's one God. Even Hindus will tell you that they believe there's one God, believe it or not. <laughs> As they have this polytheistic religion, that some of them will actually tell you, no, 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 we actually, those are just all these different uh, um, avatars. But there's still one God. They'll tell you that. I mean, there's, maybe not all of them will, but I, I've definitely talked to them. It doesn't matter what, what people say. I mean, believing one God, first of all, is in salvation. But second of all, nowhere does it say that devils or angels, right, because devils are just fallen angels, have a plan of salvation anyways. Of course they believe that there's one God because they see one God. Because they're in the presence of God. They can go, they, they're, they're like literally could see God on the throne. That's not even really believing. That was just insanity to reject. It would just be like, how could you not? I mean, you, you just, you see it all the time. It's right there. You know that that's the truth. You know that's reality. You don't have to believe in it. It's there. It's, it's, anyone who's ever seen my van outside knows that it's a white van. If you've never seen it before and I tell you that, you have to take that on faith that I'm telling you the truth, right? That what I'm saying is true. But once you see it, you don't need to believe it anymore. You know it's true, right? right. Oh, I believe, I believe, man, I believe Pastor Burson with all my heart. He's got a white band. You've seen it. You don't have to believe it anymore. You know it's true. It's the same thing here. The devils, they've seen God. They know there's one God. Okay, that's, that's not what that passage is talking about. It's not about devils being saved or anything like that. You can't apply it in that manner saying, oh, well, believing is not enough. You're putting all your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation is all that's required. That is what the Bible says. Believe and thou shalt be saved. So, um, in any case, as you turn to the book of Jude, look at verse number five, because we're going to see here, you know, the angels, they don't have the same plan as us. Look at verse number five. The Bible says, I will therefore put you in remembrance that you once knew this, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the, of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example of suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So he's, he's likening here the judgment of the angels being reserved that great day, like Sodom and Gomorrah, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, that that's the punishment that's awaiting these angels that left their first estate, they left their habitation, right? These would be the angels that transgress. These would be the angels or devils that are drawn after Satan, there is no, they're, they're like Sodom and Gomorrah, the reprobate. Yeah. Basically, I mean, there's, there's no hope for them. That's that, okay, they're drawn after Satan. There you go, they're done. Awesome. <laughs> so there's a big difference between men and angels. Very big difference. There is no plan for them that we can see at all in Scripture, and I believe the Scripture is complete, and we, you know, there's no reason to think Otherwise, and specifically Jude says, hey, they've got, they've, they're already in their, their everlasting chains of darkness. Like, they're just waiting for that day to come. Just like the devil said that we're possessing people, hey, art thou come to torment us before the time, to Jesus. Like, they know the condemnation they're in. They know that they're just waiting to be cast into that lake of fire, and they're saying, like, okay, well, I mean, look, we've still got some time left, right? What are you doing? You, you here already before it's time? Because they know. They don't have to have faith. They know. 
But the point that's being made here in Hebrews 2, go back to Hebrews chapter 2. Every transgression disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Right? Hey, they're not escaping, right? The angels, aren't, the angels were made greater and mightier than us. Their transgressions have a just recompense of reward. Well, so will ours. It's the same exact thing. Hey, we have that threat of that judgment and that, um, you know, the, the, the fiery judgment of God to come, which is why we can't neglect that salvation. And then it talks about this salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So what we're seeing here is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ spake of salvation. So that great salvation was spoken by the Lord. Those that heard him directly, his witnesses, confirmed those words that Jesus spake and taught. They are his witnesses, his disciples, his apostles went forward and taught the same things that they heard out of Christ. And they brought that great salvation and deliverance to the people around them. And then on top of that, they confirmed the words of Jesus. God confirmed their words through the power of the Holy Ghost. So this is then when God is confirming their work, confirming what they're doing with these gifts of the Holy Ghost, with these various miracles and these gifts. Right? And he's saying, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which was delivered unto us in this manner, right? In the manner of Christ, his disciples, and then all these gifts being given, confirming that. Now, I want to just, you know, this passage is one of the thing, one of the places that we could look to as support for what was the purpose of the signs and the miracles and the gifts that God was given, it was to confirm the message. This is an important doctrine because people will want to say that, hey, things today, they're just like they were in the book of Acts. God's got these gifts of healing and tongues. And, all these, and again, it's a Pentecostal church which will cleave to this stuff. And they'll turn to places, I'll just turn to real quick, like Mark 16, and try to teach that if you don't have these things and you're not saved or whatever, and they'll look at a passage like Mark 16, verse, well, verse 16, they'll say, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So they're saying, see, hey, if you're saved, you've got all, you, you're going to have all these things. You're going to have these things, because it says these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, we see the snake handlers. And we see them die from snake bites. I'm not kidding. I mean, they're in Georgia, which I never thought about that before moving here. But like, this is this is one of the the, the areas that has the backwoods snake handling, Baptocostals out there that'll that'll try to teach you that, um, yeah, no, that you you know, we we handle these snakes because you know the Holy Spirit's with us, and and these things follow them. To, you know, it's like this is ridiculous. I don't want to get too in-depth on this, but all of the things that are mentioned here, we see come to fruition in the early church with the apostles and disciples. Like the apostle Paul had a serpent bite him, and then he shook it off, and the people that saw it, they're like, man, that was a venomous snake, and they thought he was ready to fall. Like they thought he should have fallen over dead because they, they identified the snake. They saw the serpent that bit him, and they're thinking like, man, this guy's going to die. And then they thought that he was a god because he didn't die, right? But that was God protecting him. God had the work for him to do. And now look, any one of these things individually, I think God still completely, of course, has the power to do today. The power is not gone. But we also have to understand, why is it that 
while in the book of Acts, you can see people, I mean, they were Peter and James and John and even Paul. I mean, they're going around, they're able to heal people. They're able to cast out devils. They're doing all these great miracles and wonders. But you don't see that happening today. The only thing you see happening today are the, are the copycats and the frauds trying to mimic what was done here in the book of Acts. But they're, they're clearly not of God. The, the, the big names, the Pentecostal group, right? the, the people like that. It, it's clearly a fraud. It's clearly not real. The reason why is because, first of all, there was, and as we're going to continue in the book of Hebrews, see this, and it's evident, there is a change. There is a difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. So if, if you're going to change anything in the service to the Lord and things that pertain to God just at all, the, the, you've got the temple or the tabernacle, your offerings, all of this stuff, we better make sure that any change is literally of God. Now, the changes, there are changes, and there's, I'm not wrong, and there's nothing wrong with using that term, but they're really fulfillments of the law and was still all part of the, the, the great plan. It all has to line up with Scripture, but God is confirming, yes, these changes are authorized by me. This actually is coming from me. This is actually the Word of God. I'm actually telling you now to do these things. I'm telling you now that things are a little bit different. This is being confirmed through the power of God, through the power of the Holy Ghost, so that everyone can witness it and see, no, man, this is, I mean, these things can only be done through the power of God. So because there was these changes and because we have this whole New Testament delivered in such a short period of time, right, with, with all of the changes compact in a very small time frame, God confirmed that, yes, this is of me, yes, this is true, which is why you have the signs and the miracles. That's why it's there. God's putting a stamp of approval going, yep, this is of me. And it all, of course, the scriptures all match up. They line up. There's no contradiction. We know it's the word of God, but God definitely had to add that. Just as Jesus did his miracles, proving he was the son of God. Right? He... He had to, John the Baptist did no miracle. People believed or not based on the word of God, but when Jesus Christ, the word made flesh came, he proved himself over and over again beyond a shadow of a doubt. And that's why when people were trying to say, oh, the, work, you know, the works that he does are through Beelzebub, they didn't receive forgiveness. They were witness to everything that Jesus was doing and it's like, it's, it's kind of like the, the angels who are witness to God in heaven and still, like, if, if they're still going to turn on him and still reject him, then they're just going like, okay, well, you're just damned forever now. And those that never have forgiveness are those that see the power of the Holy Ghost. They're right there. They're witnessing it all. There is no other explanation. It is clear to them. It is evident to them. And they still just refuse to accept it and reject it. Okay, you're reprobate. You have never forgiveness now. You're trying to say that that's of the devil, that all these, all the, all the good miracles that God is clearly showing you is of the devil, then you are damned forever. You never have forgiveness. This was the purpose of the gifts. They were confirmed. The words were confirmed. The words of the apostles, the words of the disciples confirmed the word of Christ and God confirmed those words through those signs and miracles. Just like Jesus Christ had the signs and miracles that he performed, verifying his own words, well, the apostles and disciples, they, they were witnesses to those teachings. That's why the Gospels are the book of Matthew. The book of Mar Jesus didn't write them down. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they recorded what they heard with Jesus Christ speaking and teaching to them and to the multitudes. That's their witness. That's their record. And God confirmed both the words of Christ and the words of the apostles and the disciples with these signs and wonders. And why we don't see as many today? Because God doesn't need to confirm his word anymore. It's settled. It's done. It's been established. There's no purpose for it. Now, from time to time, can people be healed? by Absolutely. Absolutely. Yay, someone could even be brought back from the dead. I mean, it happened in the Old Testament with Elijah, with Elisha. You see, you see some of these rare examples of 
great miracles being done? Sure. But it was never on the scale like it was in the book of Acts. But again, on that scale, it was necessary because you're going literally from Old Testament to New Testament. And, and this is, it's the perfect answer as to why. People say, well, why? why? Why could they do it, and why are we not doing it? Well, that's why, because you understand what the purpose is. Hebrews 2 tells us the purpose. Verse number 5, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. So, again, another difference between the angels. He said, the world to come are not, angels aren't ruling the world to come. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. So man is, is in, the, you know, in the pegging order. Man's made a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. So even though man wasn't made higher than the angels, man has been given a more superior position in the sense that they're being put, given dominion over God's creation and, and being put in charge of things and where those that were, that were higher are ministering spirits. It's, you know, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. You know, if you're a servant, you're going to be a, a ruler. If you're a ruler, you're going to be servant, things like that. That's, that's how God functions and God operates consistently throughout Scripture. You're going to see over and over again that that concept and it's it's the same thing with angels angels were made hey they're made with a lot of glory and honor in one sense but they're made the ministers and the servants right and you know what praise god for that but then we're made lower we're more base of a creature but then god has crowned crowned us with some glory and honor um verse 8 says thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing uh, that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Now, when it says in verse 6, one in a certain place testified, saying, this is a quote from Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. And I'll read it for you. You can look down at Hebrews 2. You'll see that this is exactly what's being stated here. Verses 4 through 6 in Psalm 8 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Same thing that we see here in Hebrews 2, 6 through 8. Now, what's great about this is that there is a dual application of this passage. There's the, the surface one, I believe, where he's talking about man in general. He's comparing man with angels. He's saying, hey, what is man anyways? Like, who, who is man Wow, what, what a great thing that God just considered man who, I mean, we're lower than the angels, everything else, but he's still given us this, this great job. He's given us glory and honor and, and is putting us in a great position and we're going to be in charge of the world to come. We're going to be ruling and reigning with God and Christ. And wow, how amazing is that for simple man to be put in that position? That is absolutely true. And this is a church thing, but we're also going to see that this is also specifically talking about Christ. And this is applied to Christ specifically here, especially when this phrase, hey, not, not yet are all things put under him. On the one hand, not yet are all things put in subjection yet, because we're not ruling and reigning with Christ. Everything is not in our dominion. Now, man in general has dominion over the creation, but not everything yet has been put in place from that perspective. Now, from the perspective of Christ... And I want you to see this, too, before, before we, I'm going to be turned to 1 Corinthians 15, but before we turn there, notice these similarities. So, from the man perspective, and we're looking at that quote from Psalms, it says that, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, in verse 7, Thou crownest him with glory and honor. Look at verse 9 in Hebrews 2, but we see, Jesus, now specifically talking about Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, just like it said that man was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, just like it says, thou crownest him with glory and honor. But Christ's glory and honor is a little bit different than our glory and honor. Wouldn't you say? The glory and honor that we could receive from God 
first of all, is only going to come through Christ anyways. We don't have our own glory and honor. So what man receives, now you could say it's a glory and honor that God would even allow man to be in a position to have dominion over the world. Okay, but that's n nothing compared to the glory and honor that Christ has received by being made like a man, being made lower than the angels for the suffering of death. That was the reason why he was made lower than the angels, for the suffering of death. And because of that suffering of death, that's why he's able to be crowned with glory and honor. So this passage in Psalm 8 that's being quoted in Hebrews 2, it's also showing us how specifically this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. While on the one hand you can read it and be like, yes, this applies to mankind in general, but more specifically, this is much more specifically a prophecy of Jesus Christ, and these are exactly the reasons why. And it's, it, it couldn't be clearer, Hebrews 2, 9, saying we see Jesus, he's a subject, and applying that passage to him. Now, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, because I just want to cover this quickly. Not yet all things are put under him. So understanding this as Jesus in this prophecy, what, what do you mean not yet are all things put under him? Look at verse number 25, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, is a great chapter about the resurrection. talks about the um, spiritual body versus the carnal body and, and, and you know, how things are going to change and the different types of flesh and everything else. 1 Corinthians is a long chapter, but a lot of things there about the resurrection. starts off talking about the gospel and about the promise of resurrection and uh, seed and everything else. Look at verse 25. The Bible says, For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death is the last enemy. Death is the last thing that needs to be put under his feet. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest, excuse me, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. That's meaning God the Father putting all things under Jesus Christ, but God the Father is not under, you know, like under him, right? So, so the one giving him all of that He's accepted from the all things. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that puts all things under him, that God may be all in all. Jump down to verse number 51. So it says here, the last enemy is death that shall be destroyed. Verse 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So all things being not yet put under him, the last enemy is death. But once death is destroyed, then all things truly will be put underneath him. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter number two and, and, and just keep that in mind about this, this concept of death being swallowed up because we're going to see that here. Um, another, another reference to that a little bit later on in the sermon, the importance of death and, and Jesus conquering death specifically. Verse nine again, but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For every man. Not for some men, not for just the elect. For every man. Christ died for every man. He tasted death for every man. For God so loved the world. The wor not part of the world. Not the Middle East. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever 
whosoever, that's elect, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. All men, look, this is, this couldn't be clearer. I'm sorry, the, the, don't get sucked into the lies of Calvinism. Um, they want to sound all intellectual and smart, but really when there's something so basic and so simple, just right on the surface telling you, look, I mean, Jesus Christ died for everyone. You try to teach me limited atonement, you're a fool. You're a fool. I'm sorry. You just, you cannot accept what the scripture just plainly says on the surface at all. One more example of this right here. Very easy truth. That he, by the grace of God, should taste death forever. Now, not every man is going to have that payment applied to him because they don't all believe. But he did die for every person. The opportunity is there. The payment's already been made. The gift just isn't given because people haven't accepted it. They haven't asked for it. But here's what's here's stupid about that. If someone does ask for it, it's not like Jesus has to go and pay for it because it's already paid. Oh, another person wants it. Let me go pay for it real quick. No, it's, all, it's already been paid for everyone. And since God wants, God's not willing that any should perish. God's not willing, which means God doesn't want it to happen. Sorry, sovereignty of God. Everything that God will happen. Look, God is not willing that any should perish. God doesn't want people to die and go to hell. But it still happens. He wants everybody to come to repentance. But he doesn't force it on you. That's the key. That's why things happen that God doesn't want to have happen. It doesn't mean he's not in, in charge or doesn't have power or somehow is not almighty. Of course he's almighty. But he's chosen to give us a will and let that will play out and literally let us make decisions. God's powerful enough to do that. And it doesn't diminish anything from his power at all. But I'm not going to get too far off into that. Let's keep reading here, verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. For whom? We're all here for Christ. And we're all here by Christ. Because Christ created everything. We saw that in, in Hebrews chapter 1, right? God made the worlds and planets by Christ. We were made for him and by him. He made us here for his pleasure. We are and were created for that reason. Some of us need to remember that a little bit more often, too. You're not, he, you're not, he, God's given you a will. But he didn't put you here for your pleasure. He put you here for his pleasure. That's why we're here. And honestly, understanding that actually does give you more pleasure. Knowing that, understanding that, living that. The more you live to please God, the more pleasure you will find in this life. It's amazing how that works. It's a simple formula. And the more we try to think about ourselves and become self-centered and self-focused and me, 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 I got to take care of myself and I got to do this and do this and do this and do this for myself, the more miserable you're going to be. It's honestly, it's, it's, it's amazing the way that works. And it's so simple, yet so difficult at the same time. It's not complicated, but we have a hard time sometimes putting these things into practice. For it became him, again, verse 10, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. So perfect. Jesus Christ was already perfect as far as sinless goes. He's made complete through sufferings. The captain of our salvation is completed by going through all of those sufferings. And we're going to cover more of this in the future. But it's, it, it's brought up in multiple chapters how amazing this is to have a Savior that was one of us that knows exactly what it's like. Now, he did it perfectly. He did it righteously. But, but there, is, there is no greater connection that we could have with a God that, that actually knows 100% what it's like to be in our shoes. made perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. We're all of 
God in the sense we're born, if you're born again, of that spiritual seed. We're sanctified through Christ. Christ sanctifies. We're made sanctified, all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So why is it that God, that Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call us brethren? Because we're born of the seed of God. The inner man. God's not ashamed to call you his brother. Now, our flesh is not of the same seed, right? So we don't want to be in the flesh making Christ ashamed because, you know, the Bible also says that, that um, whosoever is ashamed of me and my word, you know, him also shall the Father be ashamed when he comes. And on the one hand, we don't want to be that shame, but if we do, that's through the works of our flesh that we are becoming ashamed. But that inner man is never ashamed of that spirit, that born-again child of God, that perfectly sinless spirit in, within us. That is, that is who we are in the spirit, the spiritual sense, right? And this flesh will die away, and that's all we'll, we'll have left until that flesh is changed and we're given that perfect flesh as well. He's not ashamed to call them brethren. And, and what a great, I mean, that's just a great comfort to have anyways. Isn't it great to have someone by your side? Someone that you could faithfully rely on and depend on. Just, you know, I know Jesus will always be there for me. These, I mean, these days you can't even know if your spouse is going to be there for you, but you know what? Jesus will always be there for you. That's a comfort. And of, and of all things or any people, whatever, that you could have with you, I mean, Jesus is the, <laughs> the most important one that you'd want to have with you anyways. That's going to be the, the, the most strength and the most support um, and everything else. Now, obviously, if we're living godly, we ought to be able to be that way towards others as well and reflect that faithfulness that Christ has for you um, through your own actions unto others. But it's great to know that, that Jesus is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. So this is quoting Psalm 22. If you want to turn back to Psalm 22, we'll look this up real quickly. There's actually quite a bit in the context here that I want to get to. Or at least read through. I don't have to cover all of it, but... And you'll notice there's a few um, references to Old Testament Scripture. We, we already had one reference to Psalm 8. Now we've got Psalm 22 literally being quoted here. And we're also going to see Isaiah chapter 8 being quoted as well um, in just a minute. So it's all talking about Christ. Hebrews is, and in in, in specifically in chapter 2 and relating Christ to these Old Testament passages, confirming who Christ is, that Jesus is the Christ, and shedding light on these prophecies of the Scripture. And Hebrews 2, uh, 12, making this statement, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee, calling out the point that we are brethren, and that he's not ashamed to call us brethren, based on this passage, and when we go back to Psalm 22, it is abundantly clear that this is talking about Jesus Christ in the context. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death for dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. Piercing my hands and my feet, I wonder who that could possibly be about, right? Telling all his bones means he could count them because he was whipped and beaten. And he's hanging on the cross. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Of course, this is talking about Christ. We see this 
uh, multiple places in the Gospels, but be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, hasty to help me, deliver my soul from the sword, my darling from the power of the dog, save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Now, I just want to make note of this. Well, let's just read verse 23 and verse 24. The Bible says, Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye, the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye, the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Now, in Hebrews 2.12, it says, quoting this passage, I, I, uh, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Blessing, praise unto thee. And in verse 22 in Psalms, it says, in the midst of the congregation. So showing us that the word congregation and church are synonymous. There's a lot of people who have issue with the King James. Oh, it uses the word church instead of ecclesia or, you know, whatever. It's like, look, if you look at the scripture, you could understand what the word church means. People don't like it because, well, people nowadays associate the word church with a building. Okay, it doesn't mean it's a wrong translation of the word. Because a church is a congregation. And it is in English, that's what it means. And if people misuse a word, it doesn't mean that the King James is wrong. Just learn what the word means. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a handful of words where, has, a, has the meaning slightly changed over time? Yeah, it has. Yes, it has. Honestly, things have changed a little bit, or our usage of the word isn't exactly the same. It, it might primarily use one definition over another similar one. Fine. But you could learn that and figure it out from, from looking at the Bible anyways. And if you're looking closely, and if you're not looking closely, but at least you're coming to church, you're going to hear this preached and taught. And understand, I mean, how many of you already knew that? Church and congregation, right? Yeah. Everyone's nodding their head, raising their head. Yes, you already knew that. Why? Because you heard it before. Because you've seen it before. Because right, it's right there. It's plain. It's easy, to, it's easy to understand. But we love this. I, I love this view of declaring that name unto my brethren. Hey, I'm in the mid, he's in the midst of the congregation. You know, he's, he's here with us, right? Christ being with, Christ is the head of the church, but he's also right there with us. So like the Bible says, where two or three are gathered together in thy name, there am I in the midst, right? Christ with us, gathered together in the, hey, when we're singing, what a great vision that must be. If we could think about it and call these things remembrance, when, we're, when we sing our last song tonight, when we're singing praises to our Lord and Savior, just think Christ is here with us and he's not ashamed to call you his brother. He's here amongst brethren as we sing praises unto the Father. It's pretty cool. That's what the passage is saying. Now, let's go up, go back to Hebrews chapter 2. I just want to go up a little bit and, re and recap this because we're going to hit verse 13, and I want to make sure we get this in context again. Verse 11, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him, and again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. So this reference to not being ashamed to call them brethren, he's giving three references of support for. Now, that second one where he says, I will put my trust in him, I didn't take the time to try to figure out which specific time the Bible references. I'll put my trust in him because it's actually in the Bible a lot. Like, I didn't even bother to try to look it up and see, well, which specifically w w place was he talking about putting my trust in him. It seemed pretty vague. I'm sure with enough study, I could go, oh, this in the rest of the context is now going to fit perfectly here. But I apologize. I didn't do that for you tonight. So if you find it and, and you go, you know what, this passage where he's talking about putting his trust in him matches, great. Thank you. I'd be happy to hear that and see that. Um, but I believe it's there. 
because he wouldn't be referencing it otherwise. But I do know where, behold, I and the children which God hath given me comes from, because that's a lot easier to find. Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, the Bible says, Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me, and notice this in Isaiah 8, 18, are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. And that ties in again perfectly with this chapter as well with the signs and the wonders given for Israel. So I thought that was pretty cool that this reference covers that in addition to just I and the children whom the Lord hath given me, the brethren were family with Christ. It's awesome. Hebrews 2 verse 14. Let's finish up this chapter here. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. So there's those who have a fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And without Christ, you ought to be fearful of death, right? And Satan has that power of death because Satan lures people into sin. And then when you die, you're going to go to hell and have that condemnation with him. But as I was talking about, I said, remember that in 1 Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. So through that resurrection, through the death and sacrifice of Christ, we don't have that fear of death anymore. No saved person should ever have a fear of death at all because death has no more dominion over you. At all. It's, it's a passing. And it's not a passing to a bad place. We're passing on to a good place. Hey, we have eternal life. Death is swallowed up. It doesn't mean anything anymore. The, the, we have nothing to fear. No reason to have any fear of death whatsoever. Not one. Not one. You may fear maybe physical pain before death comes, but you don't have to fear pain. You don't have to fear death, right? Some of you might be like, man, I don't want to be like tortured to death. Yeah. But, but the death would be a good thing, though. I mean, if you're being tortured, it's like, I just want to die now, then. Just make me die faster. But people who don't have Christ, it's better to be tortured here on this earth than it is to go to hell. Yeah. I mean, literally, because that's even, that's even worse. Yeah. We're delivered who through fear of death, subject to bondage all of our lifetime. Until we get that new life, we're subject to bondage. And through this death, Jesus, the, the, the death that Jesus had, he destroyed him that had the power of death that is the devil. Now, to destroy the devil, notice, he didn't take on the form of the devil. Who's a devil? An angel, the fallen angel. He didn't take on the form of an angel to beat the devil. He took on the form of man who is in bondage to that fallen angel. To defeat that fallen angel, he was made the flesh of man to then swallow up and overcome that power that the devil is using over man and provides a perfect escape from any of the wiles of the devil, from any of the attacks of the devil, to completely upend and overturn any power that the devil might have through Christ. It's nothing now. Nothing. What can he do to you? We don't have to fear death. That's the power that he uses, fear of death. We have nothing to fear. No reason to fear the devil. Now, it doesn't mean you mock or ridicule or, or say stupid things and, and whatever about the devil, but we don't have to fear him. We have nothing to fear. We don't want to tempt things and, and go on and, you know, people make some stupid comments. Oh, I, I'm fighting the devil and you come on and bring it down. Come on, try to give me one. You know, like, look, no, we're not. I mean, 
Angels are mightier than we are. The devil's a lot mightier than we are. But we're not afraid of him. But we're just going to do what God tells us to do. We're not going to have a proud attitude. We're going to let God judge him. God will take care. Let the, Lord, let the Lord deal with him. And that's even what we see in Scripture. You know, even with Michael the archangel, you know what? The Lord rebuke you. God, God will take care of you. I didn't even waste my time with you. God's already got you in everlasting chains um, under darkness for, that, for the punishment of that great day. Now, I, I just think it's great, though, that, that this, con this, and this is one of the reasons, because we're kind of culminating here with why, with, with the whole angel versus human thing. Christ taking on the form of a human to overcome that angel, the fallen angel, the devil, the anointed cherub is what, what he called in uh, Ezekiel. Verse 17, wherefore in all things it be behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. And I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail. I'll probably reference back to these last couple verses, so I don't want to go into them tonight. Um, just that whole concept of, of being able to identify with Christ because of him being made a man is, is like I said, it's, it's brought up multiple times in Scripture, and I want, to, I want to cover that more in a later chapter. So this is kind of the beginning of that as we continue to go through these chapters and on with that same thought. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, this passage and for all the great truths here. We thank you for um, this, the excellent plan that you have for our salvation. Lord, I pray that you please help us not to let things slip, but that we would um, take heed, take heed to ourselves, take heed lest we fall, dear Lord. And... Um, Pray that you please open up our understanding. God, we all love you here. Help us to make sure that our priorities, uh, that our actions match our priorities, dear Lord. I pray that you would um, work with us, work through us, dear Lord, and um, keep everyone safe as we go our separate ways this evening. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.